Hello everyone. Welcome to our hands-on training exercises. Today, we'll show you how to produce quantitative maps of biophysical variables from hyperspectral data using the Nmap box, even when there are no in-situ measurements available. Let's start by opening QGIS Desktop. Please ensure that you are running a current version. In our case, that is 3.26.3. .3. In addition, make sure you have an up-to-date Nmap box plugin installed at least version 3.11. Instructions on how to install the Nmap box can be found in the info box below. Now, launch the Nmap box by clicking on the Nmap box icon. Then, take a look at the auxiliary data that we've provided for download. There are several folders, through which we will go step by step. First, we open the folder containing the airborne data. Here you will find a raster image in BSQ format. As the name suggests, this is not satellite but airborne data acquired by the Averis NG instrument over the Irbach area, which is an intensively used agricultural area in southern Germany on 30th of May 2021, a very sunny Sunday. Simply drag and drop the BSQ file into the Nmap box and display the scene by right-clicking on the raster layer in the Data Sources window, selecting Open in New Map, and then one of the display options. The Nmap box offers quite a range of pre-configured visualization options, but you can also define your own preferred combination of bands. I chose the Shortwave Infrared 1 configuration, meaning the red channel displays a SWIR band at 2,202 nanometers, the green channel a near band at 833 nanometers, and the blue channel a red band at 665 nanometers. Such a false color SWIR visualization is very common in vegetation applications, as areas covered by dense vegetation appear in bright green shades and open soils in pink, making it easy to differentiate the gradients in between. And here it is, our beautiful test site in the Erlbach region. The scene was captured on a perfectly sunny Sunday. By clicking on the spectrum icon in the menu above, and then clicking into the data display, you can automatically open a graph showing the spectrum of the corresponding pixel. As you can see, there are many continuous bands, a real hyperspectral data set. Now, the task is to produce quantitative maps of biophysical variables from the hyperspectral data. Such maps can provide important information for optimized agricultural management. However, you have probably never been in the area and have no information about the situation there. When using space-borne hyperspectral data, such as Nmap imagery, this is actually quite a realistic assumption. To retrieve the variables in a computationally efficient way, we will use a machine learning algorithm. More specifically, we will use a hybrid retrieval method where simulated reflectance model data is used to train an artificial neural network, or ANN for short. To do so, open the Applications toolbar from the main menu, enter the Agricultural Applications suite, and select the Create Lookup Table tool. We need to generate a training database that will be large and diverse enough to satisfy the needs of our machine learning algorithm. With the Create Lookup Table tool, we can populate the training database with combinations of reflectance signatures and corresponding model parameters. The way in which we design the training data has a huge impact on the retrieval results. First, we need to define some general settings, such as the sensor for which the training data should be compiled. In our case, this is the Averis NG Airborne sensor, but please note that spaceborne instruments such as Nmap are also part of the list. Then, we need to define the combination of leaf optical properties model and canopy radiative transfer model that we would like to use. For this example, we use the default option, which is the well-known combination of Prospect D and Foresail, commonly referred to as ProSail. And, as we do not have any detailed information about the spectral characteristics of the soils in our area of interest, we also use the default soil spectrum as background. In the Settings section, we can specify the number of statistical drawings that will populate the lookup table. Selecting larger numbers here will result in potentially finer increments between the different parameters.
but also a large file size. Aiming for a good compromise, we keep the default value of 2000. Next, we need to define a destination folder. For example, the second one of the set we provided for download, and a file name under which the newly created training database will be stored. For example, agrimove for the no data value and the multiplication factor to convert reflectance, we will also assume the default values of negative 999 and 10,000 respectively. Then, check the box to the right in order to include the natural covariation of chlorophylls and carotenoids in your training database that is often observed in nature. Now, the bottom part of the panel contains the leaf optical properties model parameters, as well as the canopy model parameters. Let's start with the leaf model parameters. For every parameter, you may choose between four options to enter parameters in your training database. Using fixed values, following a statistical Gauss distribution, or a statistical uniform distribution, or entering values in logical steps. Ideally, the settings for the individual model parameters should be based on your a priori expert knowledge, allowing you to constrain some parameters to the expected value ranges. As in this exercise, we assume that we do not know very much about our area of interest. We will parameterize the training database in a very general way, using the following entries. For the structure parameter n, we select a statistically uniform distribution between 1.0 and 2.0. For the chlorophyll distribution, we also select a uniform distribution between 0.0 and 70.0 micrograms per square centimeter leaf area. This very large range is due to the fact that we have no a priori information about the situation in the Erbach area. For the water content, we assume a uniform distribution between 0.001 and 0.04 centimeters of absorbing water layer, and for the dry matter content, a uniform distribution between 0.002 and 0.01 grams per square centimeter. At this stage, the carotenoids cannot be adjusted due to the checked box above, but are calculated based on chlorophyll. For the brown pigments, we select a uniform distribution again and enter values between 0.0 and 0.4, as well as for the anthocyanins, for which we assume values between 1.0 and 2.0 micrograms per square centimeter leaf area. Proteins and carbon-based constituents cannot be adjusted because our selected leaf model does not take them into account. Perhaps you can use them in a future application if you choose, for example, the Prospect Pro leaf model. Okay, we are finished with the leaf model parameters and can continue with the canopy model parameters. Just change the tab above. We will start with the leaf area index that can best be described by a statistical Gaussian distribution between 0.5 and 7.5 meters squared per meter squared, which is pretty much the full range of values that we observe in nature, and set an average value of 4.0 and a standard deviation of 2.0. Now, the graph on the right displays the distribution of the variables that we just defined for our training database. For the leaf angle, we also select a Gaussian distribution assuming angles between 30 degrees and 70 degrees, with an average value of 45 and a standard deviation of 15 degrees. The hotspot size parameter is set to a uniform distribution between 0.01 and 0.5, and the observer zenith angle to a fixed value of 0 degrees, as the Averis NG sensor on the airplane observed the Earth's surface in nadir view. The sun zenith angle depends on the location on the globe and on the time of image acquisition. For the 30th of May 2021 in the Erbach area and a local observation time of 12.15 noon, we calculated a solar zenith angle of 30 degrees. As the image was acquired in Nadir view, the relative azimuth angle does not impact the model results. Thus, we enter a fixed angle of 0 degrees. And finally, we let the soil brightness parameter vary according to a uniform distribution between 0.0, .0 and 1.0. Now we can click the button Calculate LUT Size or Time on the right of the Settings section of the panel to get an estimate of how long the computation of our lookup table will take in the defined configuration. 
you may have found the process of defining the model parameters a bit complicated. For your future projects, the how to use this tool link at the bottom of the panel leads you to the Nmap Box website, where we provide detailed documentation on how to use the lookup table creation tool. Phew, that was rather exhausting. But now we are ready to run the model. Just click the Run LUT button. Depending on the size of the lookup table to be created, this may take a bit of time. Oops, finished. Now we can take a look into our output directory where the newly created files were stored. Most importantly, our training database as .lut file. In addition, there's a text file that may come in handy if you decide to modify the parameter configuration at a later stage. You can easily import this file via the Import Parameter Set button. This allows you to easily change single parameters without having to go through the entire process of configuration again. Well done! Now we can close the app and proceed with training our machine learning algorithm. In our example, the machine learning algorithm will consist of an artificial neural network, ANN for short. Therefore, please open the Applications toolbar from the main menu, select the Agricultural Applications, click on the Vegetation Processor, and choose ANN Training. In the panel that pops up, we first select the LUT file that contains our simulated training data from the second folder of the dataset. Please note, that the tool automatically sets some default values once you open the LUT file. For example, the tool automatically removes spectral bands beyond the spectral range of the radiative transfer model, as well as spectral bands affected by water vapor in open sky experiments. In addition, we check the box Perform PCA on the right to perform a principal component analysis, or PCA for short, with the default of 15 components before we run the model. Some machine learners do not perform very well when they are flooded with the large dimensionality of hyperspectral data that often include redundancy. Reducing the dimensionality using PCA has proven to be very efficient when using hyperspectral data together with machine learning algorithms. Then, we just need to set our output directory. I suggest using folder 3 and assign a name to the model. I just call mine Agrimoot. Please note that, as for the previous tools, there is a button at the bottom of the panel that links directly to the Nmap Box website, where a detailed description of the tool is provided. So, now we are ready to run the model. Just click Run and wait. Depending on the size of the training database, the number of principal components, and the computing power of your machine, this process may take a little while. Go and get a coffee or take a walk with your dog. Phew, thanks for your patience, but keep in mind that the time that your computer was busy was needed for the algorithm to learn all the interrelations between the different input parameters of the model and the corresponding spectral signatures. Well, we are all done and ready to apply our newly trained artificial neural network to the airborne dataset to retrieve biophysical variables. Therefore, we will use yet another of the agricultural applications. Please select Applications from the main menu again, open the Agricultural Applications suite, and select the Vegetation Processor. But this time, choose ANN Inversion. In the panel that pops up, we first need to select a model, which we do by loading our recently created one. In my case, that is the AgriMookDoc meta file stored in folder 3. Next, we select the input image to which the ANN should be applied, as the Averis NG image of the Erlbach area is already open in the Nmap box, we can simply select it from the drop-down menu. Then, we define the output image, for example in the fourth folder provided, and I will just call this one Agrimook again. Now, as we want to retrieve biophysical variables, it makes sense to consider only biologically active surface areas. Therefore, we could use a mask image to restrict the application of our model to such areas. However, since we do not have a mask image of the Erlbach area, we check the NDVI threshold box to the right and set a limit of 0.0, .0 to mask any non-vegetation pixels. Some datasets come with very complex geometries stored in their metadata. However, 
the geometry of our image is known, and thus can be set to a sun zenith angle of 30 degrees, and an observer zenith and relative azimuth of 0 degrees. Finally, Check all the four boxes to the right to produce outputs for four biophysical variables at once. Again, the button at the bottom leads you to detailed instructions on the use of this tool provided on the Nmap box website. Once we have set all the entries, we can run the ANN. First, the input image is read. Then, the NDVI threshold is applied. And then, one by one, the four variables are retrieved from the hyperspectral image and stored in a newly created raster file. Depending on the computational power of your machine, the application of the model may take a while, but of course, not as long as the training. You can simply close the dialog, and also the input file if you want, and click on the green icon with the cross in the data sources window to load the final result file from folder four, agrimook.bsq. The new file consists of four bands, each containing information on the four biophysical variables that we selected to be modeled. We can display the results as map by right-clicking on the raster image file, selecting Open in Existing Map and Default Colors. And wow, what a beautiful image! We now simultaneously see the information on Leaf Area Index, LAI for short, in red on the leaf inclination in green, and chlorophyll distribution in bluish colors. This RGB image displays an intuitive view of the subtle gradients of these crucial biophysical variables within the individual agricultural fields. On May 30th, 2021, the fields that were covered by dense vegetation with a high LAI are mostly winter wheat fields that appear in pinkish colors, while all fields with less green vegetation at the time of observation are displayed in greenish and bluish colors. Of course, it's most interesting to zoom into the dataset and interpret the spatial patterns. The information content of this image is really immense. However, how does this information relate to reality? Let's find out together. The usual way is a comparison of values returned by the machine learning algorithm with actual in situ measurements collected in parallel with the overflight. So far, we have claimed that such in situ data are not available. But actually, a team from the LMU Munich did go into the field on that Sunday in May 2021 when the airborne data was acquired. You can find a shapefile with the in situ measurements in folder 5 of the downloaded dataset. To import the field data, click the green icon with the white cross in the data sources window and add the shapefile to the view. With a right click on the file name, you can add the data to the map display that already contains the modeling results. Do you see the small sampling points? Unfortunately, the number of samples is rather small, as is regularly the case with the labor-intensive field measurements. By zooming in, you can see that each sampling point corresponds to a single pixel of the airborne data, which in turn correspond to the approximately 5 by 5 meter elementary sampling units sampled in the field. Now, to compare our hyperspectral product with the in-situ sample data, we use yet another Nmap box tool. This time, we select the Tools toolbar from the main menu and open the Scatter Plot tool. In the panel that pops up, we can select the information layers currently displayed in the map from a drop down menu. I select the agrimook.bsq file containing our modeling results and then the in situ data shape file. Next, we select the variable to be compared in the scatter plot from each dataset. Let's start with the leaf area index, LAI for short, from both datasets. Here we go. The data appears in the scatter plot window immediately. I suggest some adaptations. For example, changing the extent of the analysis from current canvas, which is the zoom extent, to whole raster to include all data points. You can also change display symbols or colors and add one-to-one -one and fitted regression lines to the graph. I also like to limit the X and Y axes ranges, in this case to a minimum of two and a maximum of seven for both datasets, to make them visually easier to compare, and I try to make the graph a little more square. Finally, I check the Swap Axes button, as it is a scientific convention that model results 
should always be projected to the y-axis, whereas measured data should be displayed on the x-axis. Ah, now we can analyze the plot. Although we observe some scattering, we also achieve a high correlation of 0.81 with a relatively low root mean squared error of 0.58. The slope of the regression line is 0.71, which tells us that our retrieval tends to overestimate lower LAI values and to underestimate higher LAI values. Given that we have, in a couple of minutes, retrieved these results without any information besides the hyperspectral imagery, they are actually pretty good. Remember that we went into the exercise without any a priori knowledge and trained the artificial neural network on a synthetic training database with a huge range of potential values, pretty much the entire range of values to be expected in a natural environment. This means the model is transferable and could also be applied, for example, to other acquisitions of the area captured at different observation times. Okay. The correlation for the LAI turned out very nicely, but what about other variables in our data set? The in situ data also contains information about the crop height, the phenology, and the chlorophyll. While the crop height and the phenology are not part of the canopy reflectance model that we used for the training of our machine learning algorithm, and thus cannot be mapped, the chlorophyll content was retrieved. Let's compare chlorophyll. Wow! Comparing in situ chlorophyll measurement with the retrieval results doesn't appear very successful. Any idea why? Well, actually, that doesn't come as much of a surprise as chlorophyll content is a leaf level variable that is measured in the field for individual leaves. The airborne sensor, on the other hand, observes the whole canopy from above and thus senses the chlorophyll content on canopy level. These two cannot and should not be compared. So when dealing with the quality assessment of retrievals from remote sensing measurements, always double check not to compare apples and oranges. Okay folks, that's it for the day. I hope you enjoyed our exercises and took away the message that the combination of hyperspectral data, canopy reflectance models, and machine learning algorithms enables us to infer high quality quantitative information, even from remote places where no in situ measurements are available.